Thank you. Uh, I am so grateful to be here. And before, I'm, my job is to welcome all of you tonight, but I would like to say something uh, first. Uh, I, I was in, at the Munich Security Conference when Ms. Navalny's mother got news that her husband had been killed. And I've never seen a woman stronger, with more grace, more dignity up against the world stage than, than Mrs. Navalny was that day and the weeks, the days after that. She humbled me because it, it of course, those of, us, those of us who have suffered loss understand what that means, but to suffer loss in the way that they did was extremely impactive. And, and so I just want you to know the, the, your mother is a real inspiration to me because she was strong, dedicated, and I watched her move those few days in Munich like nothing, nothing else. She's amazing. She really is. So my job is to welcome all of you here today. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I, as you know, I have a, an incredibly new job that I've been on a year, and I feel it feels like 10 years now that I've been on it. But I'm so grateful because, as I mentioned earlier today, it has given me more wisdom, more pride, more dignity in what I do, and how we face the world's indignities that, that so many people suffer from. Uh, the thing about John McCain was is that he had he encompassed so many of the ideals that were just mentioned. Uh, he did suffer from the war. He did present his ideals. He, he made sure that as a prisoner and beyond, he represented what was good, not only about America, but about himself and about being a human being. He was tough. And to, that toughness gave us so much with regards to legislation, government, uh, being a good father, a good husband, a good man. Uh, that's a great deal of what we, we knew in him. Uh, but so much of that uh, ended, as we know, not long ago, five years ago. And as uh, my good friend Grant Wood said at the time, John McCain taught us how to live. He taught us how to live well, how to be dignified and fight for what you wanted, to, wanted and to, to remind people that, that you need to be brave in how you operate around the world. You need to be brave. Stand up for those who cannot help themselves. That's what John McCain was about. But he also taught us how to die, how to die with dignity, with great respect, and with the honor of having been an American citizen who served his country. So I'm grateful all of you are here tonight. I'm so grateful that we can celebrate together, we can break bread together, and most of all, we can hear from so many people that make great effects on this world and on this globe, uh, and certainly within the United States of America. And I'm grateful to be here, and I'm so happy to be home. Thank you. Um, Ambassador McKean is a hard act to follow, and it's actually a hard act to follow. Um, Dasha and all of the other speakers from this evening. Um, Ambassador McCain, I, I have to say a few words though about what she's done because when I started this job two years ago, um, of course people would say, John McCain, we miss John McCain. He made such a difference in the world and we need him today. And over time, increasingly, <laughs> When I run into people and I say I work at the McCain Institute, they say, oh, Cindy McCain, oh my God, she's doing amazing work. She's... she's feeding the world. She's fighting for people. Um, we heard her speak at our board dinner last night, um, just giving us kind of an inside look at the life that she leads. It's not only Gaza and trying to get food into the Palestinian people there, but it's also Sudan and and I don't even know all the you know I'm gonna I'm, I'm not I can't list them all, but she's actively involved in trying to get food to people and then trying to help people in places like the Pacific Islands figure out how to feed themselves so that they, we can avert food crises. So um, it's really service above self and we're so lucky to have her um, providing an example for all of us and making America look good on the world stage. And speaking of making America look good on the world stage, the next two gentlemen have done exactly that um, up to this very moment. Um, in a few minutes, we will hear from the 71st Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. 
He has served as Deputy Secretary of State, as Principal Deputy National Security Advisor, as a Senate uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee Staff Director, many other positions in the U.S. government. Um, he will be joined by the distinguished U.S. Senator Mitt Romney representing Utah. Senator Romney is a former governor from Massachusetts. He's the founder of the Bain Company. He was a presidential candidate in 2012 who famously pointed out that Russia was a threat that we needed to prioritize as the number one threat to America. These are two statesmen who are fighting, who are leading the fight to protect the United States today. They are protecting our interests, our security, and our democracy both at home and abroad. Secretary Blinken, as you, many of you know, just returned from China and from the Middle East, so we have the privilege of hearing firsthand, I told him, you're going to tell us the secrets, right? Um, uh, you know, hearing about his work and the challenges and perhaps some progress. Um, but we also need to consider today how to support frontline democracies like Ukraine and the Republic of Georgia, which is very much in the headlines today. Uh, Senator McCain famously said, today we are all Georgians, when the Russian military invaded Georgia for the first time in 2008. Uh, today, he would be reminding us that we are all Georgians, and Georgia is really in a sensitive situation right now, sort of like Ukraine was uh, in 2014 when Russia invaded. Um, there's a lot hanging in the ballots there. So Senator McCain would have told all of us the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. We heard that earlier today. It bears repetition. These two men exemplify that spirit by working together every day for a better, safer world. Please join me in welcoming the 71st Secretary of State and U.S. Senator Mitt Romney. I don't know who gets to go off first, but I, I'm going to do that because I get to ask the questions. I'm not, I'm not the questioner usually. Usually, I'm the person trying to give answers. All right. Uh, have you ever watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? There's a little train, you know, and there's the the little king, and, and he, you know, the king is always right. You know, uh, right as usual, King Friday. My kids say, right as usual, King Romney. I mean, because I'm all, I'm always out there with the answers. So I, tonight, tonight is just to ask the questions, which I will do. But I want to begin by saying. Thank you to Cindy McCain for hosting us and bringing this extraordinary uh, group together. Uh, thank you to the Navalny family and for your beautiful words, extraordinary. Thank you so very much for your um, inspiration. It is uh, uh, touching and powerful. Um, thank you to the McCain Institute. Um, thank you to David Axelrod. I, I have mixed emotions about David Axelrod. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I appreciate the Secretary of State uh, and, and his leadership very much. And, and we're fortunate to have a Secretary of State who's a thoughtful, perceptive, um, intellectually curious, devoted person, dedicated, determined, indefatigable, uh, who has traveled the world time and time again, uh, not a person of bombast, but a person who listens and is soft-spoken. We are very fortunate to have a man of the kind of quality, uh, experience, and character as our current Secretary of State, Secretary Anthony Blinken. Thank you. So, so because I'm not noted for my questions, um, frankly, my answers are much better. But, uh, but, uh, but I'm going to ask a few questions. But if there's a little time, I might turn to you. To, uh, to ask if there are questions. I'm going to sort of go uh, topic area by topic area. I'm going to start with uh, the Secretary's most recent trip to the Middle East and then uh, turn to uh, Ukraine and then finally to China. And, um, and, and so if there's someone has a question on one of those topics, sort of, well, I'll take a breath and you can, um, uh, and, and please ask you know, questions that uh, are interesting to you, but also you might think to the entire audience. <laughs> um, uh, I, first, I'm just going to talk with regards to the, the trip to the Middle East. Give us the lowdown. Give us the rundown. What, what is happening there? 
uh, what, what's happening among the Israeli people? What, are, what is Bibi Netanyahu thinking? Uh, what's happening uh, with Hamas? Uh, what kind of a deal has been put on the table? Uh, what's, what, what is it, the people in the leadership in Qatar? You see, I can get all my questions out. Uh, I mean, give, give us a full lay of the land, uh, and then we can sort of probe areas of, of interest. Ned, thank you. And before trying to tackle that multi-part question, <laughs> yeah. actually, it sounds like the, it's a, it's, it's sounds the, like the reporters the in my pool who managed to get in five questions <laughs> yeah. for one. Uh, first, let me say how wonderful it is to be here uh, and to be with um, a truly remarkable group of people. Um, I think there's a common denominator in this room, and it's epitomized by John McCain, it's epitomized by Mitt Romney, uh, but everyone in this room is for an engaged America. Everyone in this room believes that our engagement, our leadership matters, makes a difference. And that commitment is more important than it's ever been. That's what I'm seeing and feeling around the world. Now, it may be that years from now, people come back here and look at this group and it's the La Brea Tar Pits of internationalists and institutionalists. But we're fighting to make sure that's not the case. And uh, no one has fought harder than the gentleman sitting to my right. Um, now, I admit I was going to say thank you for reading the lines that I wrote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. But um, I think you all know, uh, the country all knows, Mitt Romney is a man of extraordinary principle, married to extraordinary pragmatism. It's a rare combination. And I've gotten to see that up close these last few years that you've been in the Senate, but um, for me, it's an honor to share the stage with you. So thank you. Thank you. And to the entire McCain family, starting with Cindy, uh, following the footsteps of, of John McCain, uh, there too, I've gotten to work with, uh, with Cindy these last few years. Uh, you are doing what is maybe the greatest calling anyone could have which is trying to make sure that parents can put food on the table for their kids. And when it comes down to it, nothing matters more than that. Um, so to you, to the entire family that remains so engaged, um, it's wonderful to, to be here and to share this evening with you. Now, I have to tell you, and, I'll, and maybe the Middle East is actually, it's a perfect segue to the Middle East. Um, but let me just say quickly, before we were coming out here, we were listening, Dasha, we were listening to you. And the senator and I had the same reaction. Let's go in the other direction because we don't want to follow uh, Dasha. Um, thank you for your extraordinary profile in dignity uh, and in courage. And um, I can only imagine how proud your dad would be of you. So when I'm asked how it's going, and the Middle East is usually the first thing I'm asked about, I actually tend to quote John McCain. John McCain used to say, it's always darkest before it goes completely black. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I thank you, Cindy, for letting me borrow that. Um, but uh, now to get, get serious for a minute. So in this moment, the best thing that can happen would be for the agreement that's on the table, that's being considered by Hamas, to have a ceasefire, the release of hostages, uh, the possibility of really surging humanitarian assistance to people who so desperately need it, that's what we're focused on. And as I was um, talking to various colleagues the, this morning, and I see uh, one of my closest colleagues, John Feiner, the Deputy National Security Advisor here, um, we await a response from Hamas. Uh, we await to see whether, in effect, they can take yes for an answer on the ceasefire and release of hostages. Uh, and the reality in this moment is the only thing standing between the people of Gaza and a ceasefire is Hamas. So we look to see what, uh, what they will do. In the meantime, even as we're doing that, uh, we are working every single day. The president's working every single day to make sure that we are doing what we can uh, so that the people in Gaza who are caught in a crossfire of Hamas's making get the help, the assistance, the support they need. And we're doing that with partners like the World Food Program. Uh, and of course, we're working with many other governments. We're working uh, with Israel. I was just there, as you said, 
and I got to see um, firsthand some of the progress that's been made in recent weeks in actually getting assistance to people who need it. Progress is real, it's still not enough, uh, and we are trying to make sure that uh, in everything we do, we're supporting uh, those efforts. If you step back, I think we've seen a few things in the, ra in the last few weeks. Some incredibly promising, others incredibly daunting. And to start with the daunting, uh, we now have, with Israelis and Palestinians, two absolutely traumatized societies. And when this conflict ends, building back from that trauma is going to be an extraordinary task. We also see in all directions, and I think we're seeing this not only in the region, we're seeing it around the world. To some extent, we're seeing it in our own country. Maybe the biggest poison that we have to fight constantly, and that is dehumanization. Uh, the inability to see the humanity in the other. And when that happens, hearts get hardened and everything becomes so much more difficult. So the other great task that I think we're going to have when we get through this is to build back that sense of, of common humanity. And I hope we can do that amongst ourselves as well. But there's also some promise. There's promise in that um, one of the things we've been working on for a long time with uh, the president's leadership over many months is seeking to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And for Israel, this would be the realization of something that it sought from day one of its existence, normal relations with other countries in the region. Uh, this is something we were working on before October 7th. In fact, uh, I was due to go to Israel and Saudi Arabia on October 10th to work on this, and in particular, to work on the Palestinian piece of the puzzle. Because for us, for the Saudis, if we're able to move forward on normalization, it has to include also moving forward on the aspirations of the, the Palestinian people. So I think there's an equation that you can see, a different path that countries in the region can be on and really want to be on, which is a path of integration, uh, a path where Israel's relations with its neighbors are normalized, a path where Israel's security is actually looked out for, including by its neighbors, a path where Palestinians achieve uh, their political rights and a path in which the biggest uh, threat to Israel, to most of the countries in the region, and a threat that we share, Iran is actually isolated. Now, whether we can move from the moment that we're in to actually start to travel down that path, that's going to be a big challenge, but you can see it. And it's something that the president is determined to try to pursue if we have the opportunity to do it. One other thing on this. We saw something related that was quite extraordinary um, about two weeks ago. Iran uh, engaged in an unprecedented attack on Israel, the first direct attack from Iran to Israel. And some people said, well, it was designed so it wouldn't do much, much damage, carefully calibrated, nothing of the sort. More than 300 projectiles launched at Israel, including more than 100 ballistic missiles. John and I were in the, uh, the Situation Room watching this unfold. It's because Israel had very effective defenses, but also because the President, the United States, managed to rally on short notice a collection of countries to help that damage was not done. Um, and that also shows something in, in embryonic form, the possibilities that Israel has for, um, again, being integrated, uh, a regional security architecture that can actually, I think, keep the peace effectively uh, for years to come. So that's where we want to go. But getting from here to there, of course, requires that the war in Gaza come to an end. And right now, the quickest path to that happening would be through this ceasefire and hostage deal. I, I think uh, a number of folks, myself included, have wondered why Hamas has not agreed to other proposals with regards to a ceasefire. 
what, what are we uh, misunderstanding? What's what's their what is their calculation? What are they? Why are why are they hesitating? This I mean, we, we read about what's being proposed. It sounds like a no brainer, but they must have a different calculation. What what is going through their head? What I mean, mm-hmm. they, they want to just be martyrs? Is that I mean, what what is it that they that they hope to uh, to carry out? And why have they not just jumped on this as saying, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. One of the challenges we have, of course, is that the um, leaders of Hamas that we're indirectly engaged with through the Qataris, through the Egyptians, um, are, of course, living outside of Gaza, living in Qatar, living in Turkey, other places. And the ultimate decision makers are the folks who are actually in Gaza itself, with whom none of us have direct contact. So trying to understand what they're thinking um, is a challenge. Now, we have some sense of it, but it's not, it's far from perfect. And there are different theories about what's actually motivating uh, their decisions in this time. Uh, it's something we we're constantly trying to get at. But I can't give you a, a, a definitive answer. Um, and I think we'll, we'll see, depending on what they actually do in this moment, whether in fact um, the Palestinian people, whom they purport to represent if that's actually true because if it is true then taking the ceasefire should be a no-brainer as you said but maybe something else is going on and we'll have a better picture of that in the coming days tell us about uh, Bibi Netanyahu and what his uh, what his position of power is how he's seen among the Israeli people what the level of commitment is uh, in Israel for them uh, to go into Rafa, to, to continue this, uh, this effort. Uh, where is he, if this, uh, uh, well, I, 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 I'm going to take the if out. I was going to go back to the ceasefire, but, but what's, what's his political posture now in, in, uh, in Israel? Well, I think, as everyone knows, this is a complicated government. It's um, uh, a balancing act when you have a coalition. And if you're just looking at the politics of it, that's something that he has to factor in. But here's what I'd say generally about this. Irrespective of what you think of um, the prime minister, uh, government, what's important to understand is that much of what he's doing is not simply a reflection of um, his politics uh, or his policies. It's actually a reflection of where a large majority of Israelis are in this moment. And I think it's important to understand that if we're really going to be able to um, meet, this, uh, meet this challenge. That's at least my, my observation. I've now been there um, seven times since October 7th. Mm-hmm. And you, you get a chance to, to get a feel for what's going on in the society itself. And as I said at the start, you have a traumatized society, just as you have traumatized Palestinians. And breaking through that trauma in, in real time is an extraordinary challenge. But it's, I think, very important that we, as the United States, uh, as Israel's friend, try to share what we think is not only in our interest, but also what's in their interest. And when it comes to Rafa, you mentioned that a moment ago. Look, our position's clear. The president's been uh, clear on this. Uh, absent a credible plan to genuinely protect the civilians who are in harm's way. And, and keep in mind, there are now 1.4 million or so people in Rafah, many of them displaced from the north. Absent such a plan, we can't support a major military operation going into Rafah because the damage it would do uh, is um, beyond what's, what's acceptable. So we haven't seen such a plan yet, uh, but right now, as I said, the focus is intensely on seeing if we can't get this agreement because that would be a way of, I think, moving things in a different direction. Um, you may not want to answer this question, um, uh, but that is uh, the president sort of dipped his toe into the criticism of, of Israel and the way they've conducted the war so far, saying we're not entirely happy uh, with, uh, uh, with how this has been carried out. Um, what would our administration have done differently? What, what is our specific criticism um, and uh, and what guidance will that provide for what they do going forward? Well, let's, let's start with the, in a sense, the obvious that seems to have been um, 
forgotten or almost erased from the conversation, which is October 7th itself. Um, and it's extraordinary how quickly the world moved on from that. It's also extraordinary the extent to which Hamas isn't even part of the conversation. Um, and I think that's worth uh, a moment of reflection too. And so we've said from the start, and the president's been committed from the start to the proposition that Israel not only has a right to defend itself, not only has a right to try to make sure October 7th never happens again, it has an obligation. And so uh, that's something that we have supported from day one. But we've also said, also from day one, how it does it matters. And here, uh, the damage that's been done to so many innocent children, women, and men, again, in this crossfire of Hamas is making, has to be something that we, we focus on, as it has been from day one. Trying to make sure that the assistance gets to those who need it. Trying to make sure that civilians are protected to the greatest extent possible. Now, everyone here knows that this is a, almost a unique challenge because when you have a, uh, an enemy, a terrorist group like Hamas, that embeds itself with the civilian population in ways that we really haven't seen before and that is hiding in and under mosques, schools, apartment buildings, it's an incredibly tall order. But even so, even so, uh, I think what we're, where we've been pushing our friends, again, from the very start, is to do as much as possible and to do more to look out for civilians and to make sure that those who need the help get it. Why has the PR been so awful? I know that's not your area of expertise, but you have <laughs> to um, um, uh, have some thoughts on that, which is, I mean, as you've said, why has Hamas disappeared in terms of public perception? An offer is on the table to have a ceasefire. And yet the world is screaming about Israel. It's like, why aren't that screaming about Hamas? Accept the ceasefire, bring home the, the hostages. It said it's all the other way around. I, 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 I've, I mean, typically the Israelis are good at PR. What's happened here? How have hmm. they, how have they and we been so ineffective at communicating um, the, the realities there and our, our point of view? Well, look, I think there are two things. Um, one is that, look, there is an inescapable reality. Uh, and that is the inescapable reality of uh, people who have, uh, have and continue to suffer grievously in Gaza. And that's real. And we have to, have to be focused on that and attend to that. At the same time, um, how this narrative has evolved, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, there, one can speculate about what some of the, the causes might be. Uh, I don't know. I can tell you this. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit over dinner uh, with Cindy. I think in my time in Washington, which is a little bit, a little bit over 30 years, um, the single biggest change uh, has been in the information environment. And when I started out in the early 1990s, uh, everyone did the same thing. Uh, you woke up in the morning, you opened the door of your apartment, uh, your house, you picked up a hard copy of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. And then if you had a television in your office, um, you turned it on at 6.30 uh, or 7 o'clock and watched the National Network News. Now, of course, we are on a, an intravenous feed of information uh, with um, new impulses, inputs every millisecond. And, of course, the way this has played out on social media has dominated the, uh, the narrative. And you have a social media ecosystem environment in which context, history, facts get lost and the emotion, the impact of images um, dominates. And we can't, we can't discount that. Um, but I think it also uh, has a very, very, very challenging effect on, uh, uh, on, on the narrative. Yeah, a small parenthetical point, which is some wonder why there was such overwhelming support uh, for us to uh, shut down potentially TikTok or other entities of that nature. If you look at the, uh, the postings on TikTok and the number of mentions of Palestinians relative to other social media sites, it's overwhelmingly so among uh, TikTok 
um, uh, uh, broadcast. So I'd uh, I'd note that's of of, uh, of real interest, and the president will get the chance to to make action in that regard. The president also spoken about our commitment to a two state solution, and a, m- a number of people have said to me that's impossible, um, and Bibi Netanyahu has basically said that's <laughs> impossible. Uh, is it possible? To have a two-state solution, what what kind of? Uh, I mean, I, I know that's far from where we are right now. It's it's like a whole a different realm. But uh, is that essential to to, if you will, beginning normalization relations with with uh, uh, with Saudi Arabia and with others to say, hey, here's a vision. Here's here's some steps mm-hmm. we might get to. Is it possible? And, and what would that look like? So for me, uh, President. Uh, the answer is yes, and you can say uh, that's, um, uh, especially in this moment, uh, naive, impossible, but um, I think that it is an imperative, and let me put it this way. First, we were talking about uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia. Um, I've sat with uh, MBS multiple times, Crown Prince, and he's made clear that he wants to pursue normalization, and he'd like to do it as soon as possible if we can conclude the agreements that we're trying to reach between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But then, two requirements. One, common Gaza. Two, a credible pathway to a Palestinian state. Um, This is what people in the region need to see if they're going to fully get behind normalized relations between uh, the remaining Arab countries and Israel. Um, And it's also the right thing for the Palestinians. So there's that. But the other, I think, more fundamental question is this. You've got 5 million Palestinians living between the West Bank and Gaza. You've got about 7 million Jews. Palestinians aren't going anywhere. The Jews aren't going anywhere. There has to be an accommodation. Now, I think that some believe that the status quo that prevailed before October 7th, fine, let's live that way. And that worked brilliantly until it failed catastrophically. (laughs) So at some point, I believe there has to be a step back and everyone's going to have to ask themselves questions about what do we want the future to be? And the future that I talked about a few minutes ago, where Israel finally realizes what it has sought from day one, to be accepted in the region, to be part of the neighborhood, That's achievable. It's there, but it also requires a resolution to the Palestinian question. And I believe that um, there can be a Palestinian state with the necessary security guarantees for Israel. And to some extent, I think you have Israelis who would like to uh, get to real separation. Well, that is one way to do it. And then who knows what happens in the following years. But of course, as we say this, Um, we are absolutely committed to Israel's security. And Israel cannot and will not accept a Hamas stand coming together next door. But I'm convinced that there are ways to put the Palestinians on a pathway to a state uh, that demonstrate that the state will not be what Israelis might fear. uh, And I think can lead to a much better future than we have. Look, Everyone in this room knows. We're simplifying. After the creation of the state of Israel, you had decades of basically Arab rejection. That went away with Egypt and Jordan making peace and others following. Then you had um, some decades, in effect, of Palestinian rejection because deals were put on the table. Camp David, Ehud Olmert, others, that would have given Palestinians 95, 96, 97 percent of what they sought, but they were not able to get to yes. But I think the last decade or so has been one in which maybe Israelis became comfortable with that status quo. And as I say, I just don't think it's sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyone else? Topic, uh, Israel, Middle East? Yes, sir. You got to be real loud. I'm going to repeat it, but it's got to be short, too. All right, it's very short. Uh, you talk about Israel Palestine, Saudi Arabia being such a mm-hmm. key U.S. ally mm-hmm. in here. 
what do you see with China, Taiwan, India, Japan uh, kind of doing the same thing that China is doing? And what are the efforts we're, we're doing towards that? And what are the complications that you're running into mm -hmm. trying to overcome the China threat and mm -hmm. Russia threat with those mm -hmm. allies? Maybe that's a great segue. Did we there get a segue? Go ahead. Yeah, please. All right. Um, well, just a few things to uh, to say here. First, uh, with with China, just before please. we were in the Middle East, yeah, um, we were uh, we were in China, and about um, a little less than a year ago, um, I took a trip at a time when we had uh, been very disengaged, and I think that. One of the things that President Biden believes is that we have an obligation to try to manage this relationship responsibly. We're in an intense competition with China. And of course, for Americans, there's nothing wrong with competition as long as it's fair. Uh, hopefully, it actually brings out the best in us. But it is a real competition. But we also have a profound interest in making sure that competition doesn't veer into conflict. And that actually starts with engagement. Uh, and so we really began a process of re-engagement with our eyes wide open. And uh, a number of my colleagues followed. And then, of course, most important, President Biden, President Xi met uh, at the end of the year in San Francisco on the margins of the APEC uh, meeting. And what we've tried to do, first and foremost, is to reestablish regular dialogue at all levels. One of the most important pieces of this was reestablishing military to military communications, because the quickest way uh, to get into a, an unintended conflict is not to have those conversations happen. That's been fully restored. We look for areas where we might actually cooperate, where it happens to be in our mutual interest to do that. And I'll come back to this in a second because we found a couple. But mostly, it's so important because you want to be able to be extremely clear, extremely direct, extremely explicit about your differences and your intentions. And we have a world of differences, but it's better to be talking about them directly than it is to remain disengaged. Uh, and so what I found, in, including in this most recent trip, was that um, we're able to engage on those differences in a very clear way. It's not that, uh, that we resolve them, but at least we might have a better understanding of each other's intentions, and that's important. Second, something else has changed. Um, and this is something that we've talked about a lot and that the Senator has been an extraordinary leader on in the Senate. The relationship with China, as I said, is for us is arguably the most consequential, maybe the most complex. And I think it's very hard to put it on a bumper sticker. I said competition a moment ago. That's probably the closest we have to a defining word. But there's also contestation. And there's some areas where we cooperate because, again, it's in our mutual interest uh, to do so. In each of those areas, what makes the most sense for us is to be able to approach China from a position of strength. And that's the biggest difference, I think, that we've seen in the last few years, because we came in with the proposition that we needed to do two things in order to be able to engage China from a position of strength. One was to make investments in ourselves. And you've seen that with infrastructure, You've seen that with the Chips and Science Act. And by the way, we have an extraordinary partner in Arizona State University uh, for uh, Chips and Science. Um, that's been a remarkable thing to see. Uh, you see it with other work that we've been, that, that's been done, including on a bipartisan basis with Congress, which is also a nice thing to see these days. The flip side of the coin is the, the part that I'm uh, in part responsible for. And that's alignment with our allies and our partners. From where I sit right now, we have a greater convergence with key partners in Europe, in Asia, and even beyond on how to approach China. And I can tell you that it's something that um, our counterparts in Beijing know, notice, don't particularly appreciate, but it's a very powerful reality. If you're dealing with China on economic issues where you have a, a real difference as we do in so many areas, if it's the United States alone, we're what, 20? 25% of GDP. If we have alignment, convergence with European partners, Asian partners, it might be 50, 55, 60% of GDP. That's a very heavy weight and much harder for China to ignore. So that's what I'm seeing uh, 
right now, and it's making a difference. Last thing on this. I mentioned that it makes sense where we can to cooperate if it advances an interest. So right now, the biggest killer of Americans aged 18 to 45, not guns, not car accidents, not cancer, it's fentanyl. Every single community in this country has been affected by it. 40% of Americans know someone who has died from an opioid overdose. That's the, the impact. And of course, we know that a big part of the problem, of course, has to be solved here at home, as we're doing by investing a lot in awareness, in um, treatment and prevention, uh, law enforcement. But the other big side of the equation is supply. And how this works, as everyone knows, is you've got the ingredients that go into making a synthetic opioid, chemicals that may be made halfway around the world, in this case, in China, and made for perfectly legal reasons, but then get diverted into um, a criminal enterprise and into the synthesis of, of fentanyl, comes into the country, kills our friends and, and neighbors. So China's a critical actor in this. And we had put, been putting a lot of pressure on China to take action against some of the enterprises in China that are engaged in producing these chemicals and then illicitly transferring them to uh, use uh, in, in making fentanyl. But usually um, you, you have a chance of getting even more done if you can find a way to do it cooperatively. So the president spent hours with President Xi on this and made clear our determination one way or another to get to the bottom of this and also shared that what we're seeing around the world is a problem for which we've been the canary in the coal mine is now manifesting itself in so many other places. The criminal enterprises that have saturated our market, they're trying to make markets in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, and we said to the Chinese, there's going to be a huge demand signal on you to, to lead on this, to act responsibly. Well, one way or another, uh, they heard the message, and we now have, at least in its early days, um, cooperation that we didn't have before with China putting out new regulations, uh, China actually taking down some of the companies engaged in the illicit production of the, of the precursors or transfer of these precursors, uh, and establishing a working group together where we're working through this problem. Now, again, they have their own reasons for doing this, and unless it's sustained, uh, and unless we see certain other actions taken, it won't produce the results that we need, but at least it's a start. So I share all of that, and I'm sorry for going on, just because I think it's important to see the relationship in, its, in, in, in 360 degrees. Um, and all of that with eyes wide open, because this competition is not going anywhere for a long time. Uh, if we're approaching it from a position of strength, we'll do very, very well. Um, uh, the secretary has been kind enough to, uh, to listen to me on the topic of China, invited me to come by his office and spend some time. And, and uh, given the fact that my real career was in the world of business, um, I, I should look at China from a business standpoint and uh, believe that if I were crafting a strategy for a country or a company, I would look at China and say, brilliant, what an extraordinary job. You don't have to live by our rules, our regulations, our antitrust laws, and you've done everything that a good robber baron would do in this country uh, at the turn of the century, 1800s to the 1900s. And, um, and I wonder if we figured out kind of how to deal with this, how to confront it, because their ability to, to mount a military, they spend about as much on their military each year as we do. According to our intelligence community, they spend about $800 billion a year. AEI says 810 billion, all right? But that's about, that's close to where we are. We're 850. And, and so they're, and they're buying a lot more equipment than we are. So, um, uh, but their ability to spend that is a function of an extraordinary economy. And even though it's not as big as ours, they, they generate massive cash that allows them to make this kind of investment. They're, and then around the world with Belt and Road, spend a trillion dollars. We don't spend a trillion dollars on ourselves. They spend it around the world. And uh, uh, one of the things they did, they not following the Sherman Antitrust Act, they, uh, they said, uh, we're going to take over one industry after the other. They had 5% of the uh, 
uh, of the world uh, steel business. Now they have 54% of the mm -hmm. world steel business. They've taken over the aluminum business. They've taken over the nickel business. They've taken over rail cars. They've taken over buses. They just boom, 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 one after the other. And they, 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 keep, it, they keep it going. Uh, and when you, by the way, monopolies, you make a lot of money with a monopoly. And you drive the American businesses and the Western businesses out of, uh, uh, out of uh, uh, business. And then uh, more, I don't know how many years ago, they said, you know what? The world is going to go towards the electric world, solar panels, batteries. So while we're sitting around thinking about what kind of batteries we ought to have, and, and so they're going around the world buying up the mines and processing for nickel and cobalt and lithium. They basically have a dominant position in the major ingredients that go into uh, batteries and solar panels. So as we go into a uh, electric economy, guess who's going to lead it? We're going to have a new OPEC, by the way, but only one member of this OPEC, China. All right. And we sat and watched them do this. And then their cars come along. Do you know what a, what a Chinese electric car costs? $11,000. Why is that? Well, because they're getting the batteries where the country made a trillion dollar investment to dominate all of the raw materials in the creation of these batteries. So their companies are able to get batteries for a fraction of the cost. By the way, the battery is the biggest single component in the cost of an electric car. So of course their cars cost half as much as ours or less. How do we deal with this? And, and, and uh, the uh, secretary has, you know, has described a, a strategy which has three major principles, invest, align with our allies around the world and compete. But do we need to align more mm. to get to say to China, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep taking over industry after industry and back bankrupting our industries, dominating the raw materials we need, not selling them to us at the same price you're selling to your own people. You can't have access. To, what, what do we do? How do we deal with this economic juggernaut that, that I think is brilliant, but shouldn't they shouldn't be allowed to do it and still and, and have access to our market. I believe in free markets, but you can't have a free market if one person is not playing by the rules of free markets. So how do we how do we deal with this? How do we say enough already? Sorry, well, that I know that was well, more of a speech than it was a question, <laughs> but I couldn't resist. All right. <laughs> well, you've been extraordinarily eloquent about this for a long time, and I think it's exactly right, because what we have fundamentally uh, in the economic relationship that China has, not only with us, but with countries around the world, is uh, a total lack of reciprocity. And that's unsustainable. It was one thing when China first got into the WTO, and given where it was in its development, okay, some allowances reasonably could be made. But we're now 20 plus years later, and China is exactly as you described it, and where it is. And I think what we're hearing, again, not just here in the United States, but from so many of our partners around the world is, no, enough. We can't do this anymore. We won't do this anymore. And again, it's the, when you bring all of that together, it is, I believe, a lot harder for China to, to ignore. So we spend a lot of time working with our allies and partners on taking this common approach and making sure that Beijing is hearing in, in stereo what it's been hearing from us. And I believe that uh, this is the way to get, get change. Now, we have the immediate problem, and I think uh, Secretary Yellen was here this morning, so I don't know if she talked about this, but she has been intensely focused on this. She was in China just before I was. By the way, um, she is uh, very famous in China. Um, <laughs> chopstick ability. Oh. <laughs> um, I, when I was there, oh, you work with Secretary Yellen. Um, it's, it's, Did they it's, test you on the chopsticks? Yeah, they do a little bit. Yeah, no, that's good. Janet's that's good. really got it down. Uh, but the president's intensely focused on overcapacity right now um, because we've been through this before. We had what some called the, the China shock in the years after it got into the WTO and did exactly what you've described. Flooded our market with certain products, pushed our companies out of business, devastated some communities, uh, and we can't have that again. The president will not uh, have that again. So a big part of my, my visit as well, following Secretary Yellen, was to um, help our counterparts in, in Beijing understand that we are making major investments in ourselves, including bringing good, strong manufacturing jobs back to the United States, 
and we were not going to allow uh, our markets to be flooded with underpriced products that would drive our folks out of business. And the cases you point to in particular, uh, solar panels, electric vehicle batteries, China right now is producing, in some cases, double the entire global demand for those products. And it's trying to work itself out of its own economic challenges at this moment by exporting, but exporting in uh, unfair ways. I had this conversation with um, my uh, Chinese counterpart, the foreign minister, Wang Yi, and he said, wait a minute, capitalist economies, they work on comparative advantage. I said, that's absolutely right. But there's one thing to say comparative advantage. There's another thing to say unfair advantage. And that's what we're focused on changing. Um, help me get a sense of what, uh, how they're doing around the world, geopolitically. Um, I hear stories, I'm, uh, and I'm sure each, people, each of the people here have heard one of the other stories about how China's all over Africa, China's all over Latin America, it's all over the Caribbean, that everywhere you turn, the Chinese here, the Chinese there. And yet in their own neighborhood, they seem not to be doing so well with the Philippines and the Vietnamese and the South Koreans and the Japanese and the Australia. I mean, they, they seem to have badly misjudged what's happening right around them. Are they doing really well in Africa and, and Latin America and the Caribbean or I mean, I, I, sort of how are they doing geopolitically? Well, I think there are a few things going on. First, of course, as you mentioned earlier, um, and as you mentioned a few minutes ago, they've been um, engaged for a long period of time in their, in their Belt and Road program making major investments in different parts of the world. Um, it's had real successes uh, over time in terms of positioning them economically and positioning them strategically. The two things are, I think, very much married. Um, but we've also seen two things. Um, the way that these investments have been made, uh, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, piling countries with debt, bringing in workers from China to take on the jobs instead of having local uh, workers take them on, um, building things to substandards, uh, bringing, um, shall we say, a disregard for workers and the environment with it. Uh, that also begins to have an effect. So I think countries appreciate the magnitude of the investment. They appreciate the rapidity with which China is able to act, something that is not our forte, but I want to come back to that in a second. Uh, but then there is often... Um, price to be paid later. Now, I think China is trying to adjust because it's getting, it's gotten pushback uh, as people start to realize some of what these investments mean. Uh, the other challenge that it has is it actually has less money to invest in this moment because it has its own economic challenges. But we're also not standing still. And you mentioned that the um, imperative of critical minerals and the building blocks of the 21st century economy. We put together something called the Mineral Security Partnership, where we've gotten now more than 14 countries to work together, uh, to look together, and potentially to invest together around the world in, uh, in projects to make sure that we can build our own resilient supply chains and not be dependent on any one part of the world, whether it's China or anyone else. And we now have several dozen projects that are either moving forward or that we're actively looking at. And ultimately, our comparative advantage in this area is, uh, is the private sector. We're never going to compete with China on a state-to-state -state level, dollar for dollar. That's not the nature of our system. Our system is making sure that, uh, and one of my jobs, one of the State Department's jobs, is to um, try to make sure that we are helping open the terrain for American investment for American business. And that's exactly what we've got the tools of government focused on now is in ways that we haven't before. Development Finance Corporation, uh, other parts of the government are focused on trying to be more effective to serve as guarantors or as catalysts for the private sector. But the critical difference is doing it with other countries. Um, the president put together something at the, uh, with the G7 countries, um, Partnership for Global Investment in Infrastructure. And it's the same basic idea. Uh, any of us acting alone, it's going to be hard to, to match what China's doing. When we can work collectively, marshal our resources, or as necessary, um, have uh, some of us active in one place, 
others in another. That's the way I think you get at uh, dealing with some of the advantages that China's shown in recent years. Um, Pacific Islands are a really good example of this. Uh, China covers a lot of ground in the Pacific Islands, maybe more ground than we can cover our, ourselves, although we've made a major investment there. The president's had two summit meetings with all of the Pacific Island leaders at the White House. But when we're working in cooperation and collaboration with Australia, with New Zealand, with Korea, with Japan, with India, um, we cover a lot of ground. You're seeing that play out. You're seeing that play out with um, undersea cables. Uh, you're seeing that play out in our ability to help deliver some of the things that people in those countries want. And the last thing is this. Um, in diplomacy, uh, it, it's often more effective to say to a country, we're not asking you to choose. We want to give you a better choice. And then you make up your mind. So our responsibility is putting together that better choice. Yeah. Um, they, there's a clock up here that's telling me how long it's, I get to go. It says zero, zero, but it, zero. But it, for, for the very beginning, no, no. When we sat down, it said zero, zero, <laughs> zero. It's, it's been zero, zero, zero the whole time. So uh, someone give me the signal. If they're, oh, I'm, I'm getting this signal. I can ask one question. I can ask one question. That's my chief of staff, Liz. Thank you, Liz. It's like zero. What am I supposed to do with zero? Um, uh, and that's, help us with Ukraine, uh, your perspective on Ukraine, uh, which, uh, I mean, there are, in my party, there are people, and I do not understand the argument. I got to be honest. I do not understand how anyone can argue that we shouldn't provide weapons to Ukraine. I can't. I, I listen to they've, they've changed their argument over time from one, you know, oh, the Europeans should do more. Well, the Europeans are doing more. Oh, well, uh, we don't have enough research. They, they're, they're, we go from argument to argument. Um, but more recently, it is that uh, that there's no way for Ukraine to win, that that, uh, that providing funding uh, for weapons is, is going to lead to uh, nothing but a continuation of the status quo. Um, what's the uh, what's the pathway forward? What, what are the scenarios that you see in Ukraine? And then please offer a, a, a last word. You get the you get the final word here, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Well, first, thank you, because your leadership on this has been instrumental. And uh, one of the things I have to say, too, is your recognition uh, of the threat, the challenge that Russia posed well before many others saw it in this country. Well, I think we've we finally caught up with you. Uh, and that was a very important thing. Um, now, unfortunately, um, much of what you talked about some years ago is we've seen come to fruition. But here's the thing. First of all, um, I believe profoundly that in so many ways, despite the incredible challenge that Ukraine is facing, uh, it's already succeeded and Russia's already lost. Because keep in mind what Putin was trying to accomplish. He was trying to erase Ukraine from the map. He was trying to subsume it into a greater Russia. That has failed, and that cannot succeed no matter what happens from here on. And the reason that's failed, of course, is because first and foremost, the Ukrainian people were determined and showed remarkable courage. But it also failed because, yes, the world did come together. Uh, and I think American leadership was what made the difference. We brought 50 countries together in support of Ukraine. And that continues to be the case today. We often talk about burden sharing and Americans complain about the lack of burden sharing. This is the one place where I can say uh, without fear of contradiction that we have extraordinary burden sharing for everything that we've done. And it's a lot collectively, our European partners and others in Asia have actually done more military, economic, humanitarian support for Ukraine. So, um, I think if you, if you step back, uh, that's an important thing to recognize. The other thing that's important to recognize is that in so many ways, uh, Putin has precipitated everything he sought to prevent. Uh, what Russia has invested in this horrible adventure, uh, we see it in a country that, despite uh, the massive efforts it's making, is going to be militarily, economically, and diplomatically weaker than it was. You have Ukrainians who are united in ways that they never were before um, against Russia, and certainly before 2014. Uh, that was the case. 
Uh, you have Europe that's weaned itself off of Russian energy in a remarkably short period of time. And you have a NATO, a NATO alliance that's stronger and bigger than it's ever been. I mean, the idea um, three years ago that we would be talking about Finland and Sweden as part of, uh, of NATO, uh, unimaginable. Now, all of that said, um, this is a challenging moment. and It's been a challenging uh, nine or ten months because Russia does have extraordinary uh, resources that it seems willing to throw at this in ways that uh, most others wouldn't. Now, the supplemental that, thanks to your leadership and others, we got done was just in time. And I really also have to uh, uh, applaud the speaker, Mike Johnson, for the leadership that he showed in making sure that that got done. Um, so that, uh, that assistance is on its way. And as you know, um, of the money, the new monies that we invested, virtually all of that is actually invested here in the United States into our own defense industrial base, providing good jobs in the United States, but in a way that allows us to help Ukraine. So that's a win-win too. But here's where I think this is going. Yes, there is a real challenge in the moment on the battlefield, and we're engaged with that. Europeans and others are engaged in that. But there's also where we want to take this in the medium to long term. And on one level, it's pretty simple. We want to see a Ukraine that stands strongly on its own two feet, militarily, economically, democratically. Militarily, we have 32 countries now that have negotiated or are completing negotiations on security agreements with Ukraine that will help it build a force for the future, one that can deter aggression or defend against it as necessary. Economically, we're focused on trying to bring more private sector investment uh, into Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Penny Pritzker, our former Secretary of Commerce, who's been working on this. And there's tremendous potential there, despite the incredibly difficult uh, conditions. We can see Ukraine developing a strong defense industrial base that will help not only Ukraine, but other countries over time. We can see with what they've achieved in the Black Sea, keeping that open. There's now more getting out of Ukraine from the Black Sea than before February of 2022. Now, we have a real challenge in making sure that we get more air defenses to Ukraine so that this investment can actually be protected against Russian aggression. We're working on that democratically. The EU started accession talks with, uh, with Ukraine now. It's a long process, but that is probably the most effective way to deep root Ukraine's democracy, to ensure the necessary reforms. And the best possible review to Vladimir Putin, no matter where the line ultimately gets drawn, is a strong Ukraine. And you can see that happening. It's, uh, I'm convinced that as long as we continue the support, uh, we can and get there. Uh, we, we can and will get there. So maybe the, the, the note to conclude on is this, because I think um, everyone in this room is, is, is so uh, representative of this basic idea. What I see and hear around the world is I have the incredible privilege of helping to represent the country, traveling around, is an ongoing thirst for American engagement and for American leadership. And even the countries that are complaining about what we're doing in any given moment or don't like a particular policy still want us. And as we look at it, there's a basic choice. We can continue to engage and we can continue to lead. Or if we don't, we know one of two things is going to happen. Someone else will, and probably not in a way that advances our interests and values, or maybe just as bad, no one will. And then you're almost guaranteed to have a vacuum filled by bad things before it's filled by good things, and that will ultimately come back to bite us. So as I see it, there's now a greater premium than there's been in the time I've spent in Washington on American leadership. Um, and we have to find ways to come together to assert that and to carry it forward. I also think there's a greater premium than ever before on finding ways to cooperate and coordinate with, any, with, with other countries because, and beyond countries, private sector, uh, organizations, because for all of our uh, power, for all of our strength, um, we can't effectively deal with most of these challenges if we're doing it alone. So uh, we can't go it alone and we can't go away. Uh, and that's what we're determined to make sure uh, we're focused on as we 
carry on these next months. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Secretary of State. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy that very much. Thank you.